Hey, welcome to the frenzy. I'm Melissa Carter. <laughs> I'm Jen Hobby. What are you laughing at? I'm laughing. Wait, here we are again. Number two. This is fantastic. It's so funny. Anyway, here's our mission <laughs> statement and our promise to you, which is the frenzy is here to change the conversation around age. So that you can celebrate all of your years rather than lie about them. We are ready to share an honest and humorous take on what it means to claim your real age while rejoicing in it. I am Melissa, and I accidentally pepper sprayed my sorority sisters. <laughs> I am Jen, and I secretly host cooking shows in my mind when I fix dinner for my family. <laughs> Coming up on today's show, our guest is Christy Paul. She is an author, a CNN anchor, a mom, and she is going to give you just that boost of confidence you need because she is a woman who is killing it in all areas of her life. Plus, Betty White just turned 99, Yay. and she's got some really great tips for a long, happy life that I think will put a smile on your face. Uh, but first, Melissa, how well, are you? I'm good. I'm good. I, I, I'm glad that here we are, show number two. This is exciting venture. But I will say that something uh, that I am struggling with that I know I will have to um, face when the pandemic is over is my relationship with my siblings. Mm. Um, and the reason I say that is because Millie Pete and my mother, for those of you who listen to us on the air, you know, in Atlanta, uh, she passed away last year. My father passed away back in 2001. So I'm officially an orphan, which is the weirdest feeling in the world. But I have two older siblings um, who like it, it's it's weird because it's what does our relationship look like now that our parents are gone? Does it shift? Because so many people go through that change. You know, I've got older parents, but still have both of mine. But when you lose them, I imagine it changes not only the way you feel, but how how do you keep the glue together? Well, it's a re I think it's a reevaluation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not I'm not a big proponent of family obligation. I know that sounds horrible um, because I think that I, I I don't I don't want my son to feel obligated to see me when he's older, like Katie and I, uh, Katie, Joe, my baby mama, uh, she and I, our idea is that we want Mr. Carter to want to come home to see us. We don't want him to feel obligated to come home to see us. So we don't plan on making him feel obligated to love us. We want that to be a natural thing. So when your parents pass away, all that's left is who you are. Like the, you don't realize, I don't think, how much you feel an obligation to make your parents happy to stay close with your sibling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like in your mind, I think you're like, Oh, I like my sibling. I don't like my sibling. But then when your parents are gone, like there, you have to make a true judgment on that. So it's like, and a real to, effort and a real effort. It's like I've, I, we are here in Atlanta and I grew up near Nashville and my mother lived in Nashville, uh, you know, the last decades of her life. And, so I would go to Nashville all the time. And after she passed, I thought, I, you know, I don't really feel like going to Nashville again. And that's an odd, you know, and you have to be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. It's the, I've done that since I was 22 years old. I'm 50 now. I will be 51 when this pandemic is over. Mm -hmm. And that's a long time to make that drive. And so anyway, that's what, that's what I'm struggling with. Almost having a come to Jesus, you know, meeting with myself on what do I really want in my relationship with my brother? And what do I want in my relationship with my sister moving forward? Because before it was this collective of the three of us as the children of my parents, where now it's like we're adults happen to be related, but what does our relationship look like? And it's very different. I have a very different relationship with the two of them. And now I want that to reflect in our lives rather than us always having to cluster together as one. Right. I was going to ask, is it different with your sister versus your brother? Yes. I mean, yeah. I think my sister is 10 years older than I am. We're very different people. We usually, my brother calls us oil and water. Like we just don't mesh. We don't get each other. Um, I, we love each other, but we just don't get each other. And so I think that there should, there needs to be a limit on the tension in that relationship mm -hmm. where my brother and I have always been close and I don't want him to always feel caught in the middle of hmm. the fact that he he and my sister are very close he and i are close and then 
she and I are not as close. And so like, I always feel like he, so, it, and that's always been the spiral because we always have to be home to see mom. We were home to see mom and dad. Like we were always together t- because of them. Well, now I have a son and I know there's a motivating factor there. And now it's like, I don't want any more. I, I don't want a dynamic that is tense. And, and, and for me to have to go through that just because I have a son that they want to see, if that makes sense. Like, it's like, we have the freedom, to, well, we and have the it's freedom like, to be who we want to be now. At this age in our life, we're more confident in who we are. Like you said, we have more freedom to be who we want to be. And you're, you have your own family to worry about. So it is a shift in relationships, right? Right. right. Like it is. It's a time it, of change. Yeah. And what you do now could be what you're setting up for the rest of your life. Are you going to continue to have these relationships out of obligation or are you going to create them in a new way? Or are you going to maybe let them be less significant in your life, which is hard. I think the struggle is if they were as honest as I was, if it would, we could just be honest. Oh. Like, do you like me? Are you do sure I you like you? To be honest? Well, <laughs> and the reason I, I say that though, that. that's where you can have that lack of obligation moving forward. See, I think because I'm the youngest, I think they're so used to telling me what to do <laughs> that mm. it's very hard for me to um, be able to express myself and it be respected. Right. And so even at 50 years old, even at 50 years old, you still feel like the little sister. Yes, absolutely. And because my siblings are 10 and eight years older than I am. So I had two sets of parents. It wasn't like we didn't go to school together. We didn't hang out together. We didn't party together. It was, they were, I was always their kid sister. Um, and so anyway, I, you know, there's a part of me, it's like, I wish we could just be honest you know, and say, yes, I mean, but too many people want to honor their parents with their relationship with their siblings. They just, and, and it's not that I don't want to honor my father and mother, but it's like, I want, I kind of, as the baby want to be released from that obligation. I want to be released from all this and be able to be that adult and seen as an adult, but I don't, have you you been able to express that to them directly (laughs) yet? That's what I'm saying, Jen. I am struggling with that because during the pandemic, I have the space because because uh, now Millie Pete did not die of COVID, but she did die during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've had this time because I'm a kidney transplant recipient. I have been hunkered in my house since March of you know 2020. And yeah, we're my- doing this podcast via StreamYard. So Melissa and I can see each other and talk, but we are separate. We're not That's in the right. same studio. That is correct. And so my siblings live in Nashville. And so we haven't been together. And I know that as soon as this is done, I mean, they will have gone a year without seeing their nephew in person. So, I mean, imagine, I mean, he's six now and, mm-hmm. you know, how much he's grown and changed in that year. So I know there'll be this huge motivation to get together so that they could see Mr. Carter, which I respect, but it's the, you know, when that happens, what is it going to be like? Cause it'll be the first time that all of us will be together without any parents. You know, what is the conversation like? Well, of course, now we have to still plan my mother's service because we couldn't have a service. Mm-hmm. Um, well, if I know you, it's going to be honest. Right. Like, I mean, I don't think that you're the type of person who fakes it through a situation like that. Like, it's not like you're going to go right in in front of your son and have these conversations. But I cannot imagine you spending an entire long weekend or week or whatever with your sister and brother without having real honest conversations. So that's what I love about you is that. You <laughs> you're one of the you're, few that love me for that. <laughs> you're not afraid of the difficult conversations. And that's yeah. awesome because so many people would rather kind of keep the peace and keep it small talk and sweep it under the rug and just like, you know, kind of like ugh, barrel through it without really going there. But that's why I admire you is you aren't afraid to have those really tough conversations, but so important. And so necessary yeah. in order for that relationship to be real. Right. And I, and I, do, you know, my goal is I want their relationship with my son to be the best it can be. I, I, I think that different relationships, different, different ways you're related are different relationships. So just because, you know, let's, like I mentioned, my sister and I are not the tightest, but I don't want that to reflect on her relationship with my son. Like I'm not going to get in anybody's way. Um, but it's just like, I, but I don't want to have to 
endure any discomfort. I mean, I, I want to live the rest of my life as worry-free as po possible. I do, and that's why I'm not a big fan of family obligations because so many times family obligations equate to stress and right. that's not fair. I, I don't think that that's fair. And I think that's a really freeing thought, you know, of any of our audience members who are struggling with those same type of relationships. It may not be a sibling. It may just be somebody in your family where you just feel so obligated to have to take care of them or mm -hmm. fake through this relationship or whatever. But you reach a certain age where it's like, cut the crap. Right. I am not, I don't have to do this anymore. And I think that's really freeing to hear you open yes. up about that. And there, and it's, it has no reflection on the character or how wonderful each person involved is. I mean, that's the other thing is like, sometimes when you're related and it, you're not as, it, it's, not, it's not, nobody's bad. There's no bad guy. There's no good guy. It just is what it is. And that's the thing is like, there, it just is. And I'd rather it be is than be you know, this dream of what it could be when after this long, it hasn't been that. <laughs> so it's not going to be that. And I don't know. I just, I just, I don't like my, my chest being tight. I want the chest to not have to be tight. You know, I'm, I'm a grown woman. I'm grown. I'm a grown ass. Woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, about, right. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, you know, sharing those kind of struggles that we're all going through is really what the frenzy is all about. We wanted to start this show together to talk about the real things going on in our lives, the honest, the, the funny parts of it, the not so funny parts of it, because we're on this journey with you to find answers. You know, we want to share our lives and get to a better place together because life can be really hectic unless you got your friends. Right. Yes, exactly. Fr get the, in the frenzy. The frenzy. Uh, exactly. And someday we have to tell the story of the struggle and naming this. You talk about a struggle. That that that's going to take. That's a whole series of episodes to talk about that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but yes, I mean, and to Jen's point, like I feel like our parents complained about these things, our grandparents, like mm -hmm. it's time to really face these things as women of our age of an older age, uh, yeah. and to, and to make a change so that our daughters and granddaughters will have more freedom. I mean, we're here to serve you, but we're also here to serve future generations. And it's like, if you're in this chapter, like Melissa's going through this big change with her siblings, so many of us are going through career changes, especially after COVID. So many of us are having this big change in family structure. Um, if you're on this precipice of a new chapter or you're feeling this change in your life going on, you're not alone. And that's what we want to make sure that you get out of the frenzy is that you're not alone. You are here with friends. Okay. So Coming up, we've got a surprise for our very first subscribers who leave us a five-star review. We've got a really cool prize. It's an all-new Echo Dot fourth-generation smart speaker with Alexa. We got show and tell. Yeah, eventually, you'll have the opportunity to see us do this. If you're <laughs> listening, it's a box with an Echo Dot inside. Yes. <laughs> that Jen's holding up. It is here to make your life much easier and allow you to listen to the frenzy when you are prepping dinner in the kitchen or when you are getting started for your day and putting your makeup on or blow drying your hair and you got your AirPods in. You can just tell your Echo Dot to do whatever you need to do and make yeah. your life a little bit easier. Yeah. I know someone who they start their day by just asking Alexa, tell me the headlines, tell, you know, play my playlist to get motivated. Like it's just, it's easy as that. It's, it's to me, it's very sci-fi. I'm a sci-fi fan. It's very Star Trek, you know, so cool. computer. Can you do this? Alexa, can you do this? And there you go. And all you have to do is leave us a five-star review and subscribe to the podcast. And then you're automatically entered and we'll draw at random. So you got to try this new game, You Don't Know My Life with your friends, all right? So You Don't Know My Life uh, is a game about the quirky little experiences that make us all human. The details are different. We've all had our triumphs and heartbreaks, pop culture moments, totally changed our lives, mortifying things that happened to us when we were teenagers, sometimes in front of the whole school. And we have all kinds of stories. So you skip past the small talk, truly connect with people around you uh, and celebrate your own crazy life all while laughing your face off. So grab a pencil, join the party. You've already got the answers. You don't know my life now on sale at Amazon for just $31.99. It's perfect for your next party, uh, Zoom party or family night for the, you know, the family that you party with. <laughs> <laughs> Jen and I are actually going to play around later in today's episode. Okay. And you'll get stories out like why you tased your sorority sister accidentally. Uh, pepper sprayed. 
pepper, pepper spray. spray. Oh, Taze. <laughs> Why There's did I think Taze? <laughs> well, Taze could be, a, if I had a sorority sister I was tasing with, that may be a completely different evening. But no, I accidentally pepper sprayed. Uh, my I sister. look forward to our next round of You Don't Know My Life coming up here in just a few minutes. But first, we are so excited to share with you this awesome conversation with Christy Paul. She is a book author. She is a TV anchor, a mom, an all around rock star. You'll see her every morning on CNN New Day and throughout the week on HLN. Please help me welcome to the frenzy. Christy Paul. Christy Paul, welcome to the frenzy. Yeah, I'm so excited. You know I love you guys so much, but to know that you are both going to be, you know, in my phone on my podcast every Monday, life is good. Oh, yay, oh, Christy. So Thank excited you. excited to hear that from you. Now, Christy, of course, CNN anchor, author, singer, mom of three girls. You have been doing so much and accomplished so much in your career and in your life on such a world stage. But your story began in a small town. So can you tell us a little bit about your roots and where you came from? Rural Ohio, a little town called Bellevue, which is near Sandusky, Cedar Point, the big amusement park. That's where most people go back to, you know, memories uh, of Ohio, if you're anywhere up north near Lake Erie, which is where I'm from. And, you know, I still have some of my best friends are from high school. I see them when my grandmother died um, last year or two, I guess it, it's almost been two years ago. Uh, they showed up. They just, they showed up for me. They have always shown up for me. I try to be there for them. And I think those are those kind of last lasting friendships that you just, you can't get away from. Um, but I have a brother who's six years younger than me. Um, my parents are retired. My dad retired when my husband and I got married. He, we, took him to Hawaii and said, hey, we're getting married in Hawaii. And dad said, I think it's a good time to retire. So he was an attorney. And um, he, you know, my parents taught me a lot about service. Um, my dad was, he was the attorney for the schools, um, for the school board and did stuff for the church. And my mom was a kindergarten teacher and she has all these great, you know, stories about the things kids say, as we know. Um, <laughs> But I, I will say that when I got married the first time, I, I, I'm divorced. I was in this marriage for four years. It was abusive. Um, and the pastor at my first wedding, I swear he knew. I mean, I swear a lot of people knew. It was, it was probably one of those moments where people are looking at me and and they, they just thought, can I just yank you out of the church right now? But his whole sermon to us on, on my wedding day was, remember your roots. Mm. And four years later, when I was contemplating leaving, that message was what kept coming back because I realized that I had become somebody I didn't even recognize anymore. Mm. Um, when you go through a situation where you are with someone who is addicted to something um, in a way that it changes who they are. And it, it, it's scary. Um, he, he was an alcoholic, uh, not admittedly so for many, many years later, but you, I remember having this moment where I went to visit a friend of mine in Chicago. And as soon as I got off the plane, I just felt like I was home. We were living in Phoenix at the time and I didn't want to go back. Mm -hmm. And within a month I left. Because I got home to, you know, the Midwest yeah. to a place where I felt safe. Mm -hmm. I felt valued. I felt like myself. And it was the first time I had felt like that in about four years. So I, I wrote about that, about looking back four years earlier and how, you know, the pastor just kept saying to me, you know, Pastor Roger, Remember your roots. Remember where you came from. Remember who loves you. I feel, I really feel like it was his way of saying, you're going to, you're going to have to remember this. You're going to need to come back home here when this yeah. all falls apart. Isn't it wild how other people can know what the future, our future or what we're about to face before we can. And I've read your book and the, yes. Yes. oh my gosh, it's such a powerful story. And it reads like a movie. You know, where at points I couldn't breathe 
And I was like, oh, I had to get to the next page to get past this part. She's going through such a hard time. But it really is so impactful and vulnerable. Why did you want to put this out there and share it? Well, um, it's funny you mentioned the movie part because I've had a lot of people say to me, I feel like it's a movie and you're you're like turning the corner and I want to yell at you, no, look behind you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, so um, it's like a horror movie. But um, I had just had my third daughter and my husband was out playing hockey. And I should point out because I get this question a lot, all of my children are with my, my husband now, Peter. Um, and I was home one night by myself. And you know, when you have three children, rarely do you get a night's sleep. But I just had this incredible desire to write. So this is what I started writing because I realized, you know, this is very real. This happens to so many people. Mm -hmm. And I came from a family where I, I don't even know who was ever divorced in our family. None of my aunts, uncles, my parents have been married 50 years. So I felt like I wanted my daughters to know that I had been through this so that if it ever happened to them, they would know that they could come to me because I know about it on a very raw level. And I wanted to share with them and other people what red flags are mm -hmm. because we tend to you know kind of shut that aside when when what's in front of us is something that we really want and we will kind of put on a mask or put a veil over it and make it look better than it really is you know i was just having a conversation with somebody that i said listen you can't fall with you can't fall in love with potential you got to look at what's that. right there yeah that's a hard lesson to learn that's yeah and, and, learn. and i learned it you know i learned it Yes, I feel like our stories are very similar. Um, yeah, I was married previously to I'm divorced and remarried. My two daughters are with my husband now, Grant. But there were very similar themes from your book and what you went through to what I went through. And I just found it so brave for you to share it because there are a lot of things that I still want to hide from it because you feel shame around how did I let that happen? How did I let my life look like that? Um, that that is so that's deep and, and and i applaud you for even talking about it um because i i i did it because of my girls but also because i was having these conversations i mean at one point and you will know this then jen because of what you've been through um i was writing in the book one night and it was a really difficult thing to write about it was one of the really awful moments um that i write about and you have to to be authentic you kind of have to go back there yes and you don't want to go back there and i remember sitting there and i was crying and i just thought i just i just like pulled away from the computer and i said i i can't do this i just can't do it and literally the phone rang and a friend of mine who was living in dc at the time and was engaged to get married within two months called and said He's doing the exact same thing, you know, that I call him Justin in the book, um, that Justin did. She said, it's just happening over and over. She said, I don't think I can do this. And you're the only one I thought I could call and who would understand and walk me through it. Wow. And I kind of got, I talked with her. And we, I got off the phone. And I looked at the computer. And I'm like, all right, I'll Thank keep you. writing. Yes. yes. Because yeah. what we lived then, people are living now. And, and mm -hmm. she was living it. And you're right, Jen. I mean, I give you. It takes a lot of, um, you mentioned shame. It takes a lot to try to get over that because it's, I always say, it's funny that you were essentially a victim of abuse, but you're the one that feels the shame. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the first time, it is a gift to give somebody forgiveness for that. And especially if you're married, I think you feel, especially women, a, a real need to try to fix it, you know, to remedy it, to stick with it. And then when it happens again, and then it happens again, and every time it happens, it's like another block of bricks on your shoulder, just taking you down and down and down and down because you let it, you, you're looking at it thinking, I let it happen. So I deserve that it's happening now because I haven't done anything about it up to this point. I mean, we really do our internal, what our mind tells us sometimes is our own worst enemy. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. And also, I don't think 
that your minister, even if he had said, don't do this, you would have listened, right? Sometimes you have to get through it to really get it rather than somebody on the outside telling you, you need to walk away. Gosh, is that true? You are so, you are so right about that one. Um, I will say I got therapy right afterwards um, when I left. I got a lot of therapy and I continued to get therapy. And, and one of the things that my therapist had me do was something that's called the D Martini method. So I had to make these lists of how, how that served me because I told her, I want to get out of this and understand why I allowed some things to happen, why I married him in the first place, because I mean, Jen knows, uh, based on what I wrote, there were all kinds of signs that I shouldn't do it but I did. But she said to me, by the time we're done with this, you're going to be able to say thank you that you went through this. And I looked, I was, you are off your rocker. There's no <laughs> way that's going to happen. Yes. And do you know, I wouldn't try, I would go through it again if I had to. Wow. I mean, it would be horrible, obviously, but the appreciation I have for, for people, for kindness, for, authenticity for strength and bravery um the forgiveness that i have that i didn't have before one of the um lists that she made me make was the benefits of verbal abuse and when when she said it i doesn't even make sense right you go and she had to she had to clarify it with this and i think this is what helped she said i'm not saying what happened to you was okay but it did happen and we can't change that you have to decide not to let it wreck the rest of your life. So I ended up with like 65 answers to that question. I mean, for instance, um, it taught me how to be more independent because I couldn't, I couldn't depend on him for anything. I mean, everything was a blow up. I had to take care of Bill. I had to take care of everything. Um, it helped change my idea, and I know you guys will probably relate to this as well, as to what marriage really is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I used to think, I used to think, well, you know, if I saw people together, at least they're married, you know, they have somebody to go through life with. Mm -hmm. And then you go through this and you go, well, I'd rather be alone than be with the wrong person. Yeah. And it taught me a lot about, about forgiveness. That was probably one of the biggest ones because it wasn't just forgiving him, it was forgiving me. Mm-hmm. Like I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you about this one part of the book because it was so impactful to me. Is it okay if I read your words back Absolutely. to you? Absolutely. So this is when you are getting some therapy with Dr. Case. Yeah. And you write, I was amazed at the gravity of the work, at the gravity of words, how a simple utterance can act as a chain, binding us to a perception for much of our lives. When words are used against us, intentionally or not, we often become imprisoned by them. If we start to see those words from a new angle, we are freed from their power. And in my case, I was also freed from the man who targeted me with those words. So for our listener who is maybe going through something, can you expand on that? How do you take those words that have been so painful and become part of your narrative and change them? Um, well, I mean, part of mine, I think my strength in recognizing that was, was just the practice of being mindful of my own words from that point on and recognizing the gift. And I know that it sounds crazy, but the gift that it was for me to go through that, to recognize the impact of words. I never wanted them to use words like that to hurt somebody because I knew how it felt. You know, we had a doctor on a few weeks ago who was talking about COVID and, you know, people who don't want to wear masks and, you know, to each his own. But in a, in a situation like this, it's just so necessary in the six feet apart. And she said, the only way you're going to experience or the only way that you're really going to understand COVID is if you get it. And we don't want you to get it. And it's, it's the same thing. I would not wish what I went through on anybody, but it taught me. And one thing that it taught me that I think is most valuable to myself and to my relationships is the power that is in the words that you use. Mm -hmm. And it, it 
makes you very mindful, not just of the words themselves, but of the tone you use as well. Mm-hmm. Because with the way you talk to your kids, the way you talk to your spouse, the way you talk to your parents, your friends. I mean, if you have been hurt by words, hurting somebody back with them is not going to remedy anything. Mm-hmm. You learn to find that gentler, more understanding, more forgiving, more empathetic you. Mm-hmm. You know, as you talk and as Jen reacts and I react to the fact that, you know, like you said, you wouldn't want to wish this on anybody, but it can be seen as a gift. You know, the frenzy, we started this so that women who are older understand that their experience is also something to rely on rather than to dismiss, right? So our goal is for women not to feel dismissed or expired. And, and your words are that. It doesn't matter what you've been through. The fact that you've been through it and that you're wise from it or should be wise from it, that you have yourself to lean on. And a lot of women... I think are resistant to do that. Um, yeah, because I mean, I was resistant to do it because you feel so broken and you feel, you almost feel like you're buried and how am I going to dig myself out of this pit? You can't do it alone and that's okay. You know, I, I've talked to so many people and just try to let them know you are allowed to walk away from a relationship like that. You are allowed to walk away from somebody who's disrespecting you or talking to you in a, a manner that's abusive or harsh. Um, and I know that's hard if it's somebody at work or a boss or in a situation like that, but I think that we tend to sit in our brokenness And if we sit there too long, we're allowed to sit there for a while because you have to process it, but you have to get yourself out of it. And Mm -hmm. rarely will you do it by yourself fully. That's what, that's why I love the frenzy. That's what friends are for. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to have, I I have learned as I, and I say this all the time, um, not as I get older, because I'm not afraid of getting older. I'm always the, listen, age, weight, and salary is a number and you're not a number. Um, but I like to say as I grow up, because even though I'm 52, I feel like I'm still growing up. And as I grow up, I realize that it's less important to have a lot of friends and it's more important to have real ones Mm -hmm. and you will find them as you go Mm -hmm. and lean on them because that you, I'm sure you as a friend would let somebody lean on you. Don't be afraid to lean on those people that you really genuinely believe are for you. Because mm-hmm. they want to, they want to step up and help you. It's like you're almost doing your friend a favor by asking for their help and asking for their support. But sometimes, as women, I feel like we think we've got to have it all together. We've got to have all the answers. You know, we're the moms. We're running our households. We're running the careers. We're doing all the things, and we're supposed to have all the answers. So, when you go through hard things, it's like you got to take a step back and ask your friends for help when you need it, and recognize when you do need it. Um, you're so right that they they'll do they'll love to do it and if they don't then you know that's not somebody that you go back to right right. people will show you who they are Mm -hmm. well it's okay to walk away from a situation with a friend who's not on your side who's not for you who's manipulative right so i mean it's not just about an intimate relationship this could be a friendship too that you have to choose yourself and the people that are there to be on your team yeah and, and that's why I think friendships, I have, I have a lot of friends. I have three or four in my core yeah. that know everything that I can call and I can be as vulnerable and, you know, probably stupid and, uh, you know, having my moments with hormones like this, you know, especially at this age too. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they help, they talk me off the ledge. They remind me of, you know, who I am when I forget. Um, we do from experience gain so much wisdom. We also forget it (laughs) (laughs) it and we, it it is nice to be validated. That's something else I've learned. You know, I, I, I wonder, I catch myself going, okay, where am I looking for? Where am I getting my validation? Mm -hmm. You know, I can't get it from the numbers on television. I can't get it from social media. I mean, it's nice when somebody's kind, don't get me wrong, but my validation has got to come from, for me, it's from faith 
and from God. Because when I was getting, when I was going through my divorce, I remember watching Oprah and Matthew McConaughey was on and she was asking him, you know, you're so famous and how do you balance it? And how do you keep yourself in check without getting really arrogant or anything? And he said, well, first and foremost, I know I'm a child of God. And that's, you know, like that's mm -hmm. enough. And that has stuck with me mm. for 20 years. Hmm. It's so true. We have it's to be true. careful who we give power to give us validation. Right. It's so true. And I would imagine in your career in television, there are a lot of different messages coming at you about your value, about what's, you know, what you can do. And you're in this anchor chair, right? You've covered presidential elections, you know, then Vice President Biden. You've talked to celebrities. You've covered really difficult events throughout the world. Do you, when you're in that anchor chair, have to put on an armor, like this emotional armor? Because yes. you're, you're so thoughtful and warm and giving and kind with your personality. That's your persona. But then you're having to deliver and handle some really hard news stuff. So how do you flip between Christy Paul, the person, and Christy Paul, the anchor? Well, I am the same person on the air. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have pride on the air. It's mm -hmm. just it's just me. I've had to be saved by my anchor on more than one occasion, um, just based on some of the things, not the politics per se, but you know the stories, the, mm -hmm. the immigration stories we've done the last few years. Um, I will be very honest with you. I can tell you, I get this question a lot. The worst day of my life on the air was the Newtown shooting. Mm -hmm. We covered the first four hours of it. I sat at the desk with Mike Galanos and we got an email that said, we were talking to a woman who was at the fire station where they were having all the parents come. And she was just telling us they're, they've taken all these parents into a room and they're sequestered and we don't know what's going on. But she, this woman we were talking to had a child and we got an email. I can't even say this stuff for this day. Mm. We got an email that was not for air yet. We couldn't go with it yet. But it said, there is an entire kindergarten class that is unaccounted for. Mm. And at that moment, Mike and I had been in the business long enough to know all of those parents were being taken into that room to say their child died. Mm. And this is where I get like, I, I just, I just shut down and Mike took over. And then we got to another point where Mike shut down and I had to take over. I think you, you do it enough where you can step. I have to step out of the moment that I'm in and do what you need me to do. You need to hear what's happening. So that will take precedent in this moment. Mm -hmm. There have been more times that I can count that I have gone to my car after um, something like that or really anything that hit me and I will sob, sob before I come home. Just to yeah. let it out and let it go. Cause you have to hold it all together. Yeah. And but I, I've had my moments. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, that's definitely, so, I, I, that's one thing where I, that's, that's a new story where you mourn, like you mourn for a long time at home and it just, and, and you never get over it. Um, one of the things too about news coverage I wanted to ask you about is news coverage of older women. You know, how do you think women in general and especially older women, are they portrayed fairly or are they portrayed enough? Uh, they're probably not portrayed enough. We, we've, we're so deep into politics right now. And you look at the, the ages of women that we're covering, you know, Nancy Pelosi, yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously the, the new vice president, these are not women who are young. Um, they're not teenagers. They're not on social media, you know, um, doing all kinds of crazy things to get attention. Uh, I do think that, I, I I do think that we're doing okay mm -hmm. when it comes to how, I, I don't know that, I mean, we celebrate Kamala Harris for many reasons, obviously. It's not, I don't think it's the news. I, I think it's the uh, reaction to the news. 
Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that can be really harsh that, you know, people who don't appreciate what we're covering or what we're saying or, um, but I've had a lot of people ask me if I have been um, treated differently as a woman. Mm -hmm. I probably have. I, I can't say that I noticed it so much because I just go do my job. And it has, I am a person who feels very strongly. I have this conversation with my daughter, Sophie, because she's very sensitive. She's very strong, but she's very sensitive. And I told her, don't ever be, don't ever let anybody make you feel badly for, for being sensitive because it means that you're empathetic and it means that you care about people. And if you're going to cry, that's okay. Sometimes you have to go cry separately, but um, don't let somebody make you feel less than because of, of who you are, because God made you that way. And I think I've, I've had to grow a really thick skin. So there was one time we were talking, Michael Lanos and I were talking to, oh, I wish I could tell you who it was because it would be hysterical. Mike got into a tit for tat with this guy. They were going at it. And the, and the guy said on the air, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Let me talk to that pretty girl next to you. Oh. And I went, okay, my name is Christy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes things just come out of people's mouths. But right. I would be more interested to know what you think about how older women are covered. I mean, JLo's 50 people. Yes. Yeah. Well, 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 it's funny how you, I think that you, when you talk about politics, politics has allowed us to have these leaders. Uh, and obviously they're leaders because people have voted them there, right? So the, the general public wants them there. So you make a great point that politics to me has spearheaded this effort that I hope continues in other genres of women who are older, who are doing new things. Do you feel like it's hard though, when you see, you know, what's happening? I mean, social media is so powerful. Mm -hmm. The conversations on TikTok and, and Instagram and Twitter, you know, how much do you think that leads us to our perceptions of older women? I think it depends on who you follow. And I think it depends on what messages, you know, you're engaging with. Because that's what they're serving up to you more. But I think you're right. And it comes back to a lot of what you talk about in your book about how powerful words are mm -hmm. and how powerful social media can become when it's used as a weapon and it's used to demean other people. It's, it's, it can be really an awful place. But then it can be a really positive place too. It just kind of depends on who you surround yourself with on that in that digital space. Right. That and is I, so yeah. key. That is so key. Cause I know on Instagram, I follow a lot of really positive things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're seeing that inspiration and women and helping women, women and, and lifting each other up, or you lean on your faith a lot, you know, if you're following accounts that lean on their faith, it's great reminders because you're like, oh, there's my friend and her kids, or oh, there's a funny video, and oh, there's an inspirational message. It can be great. But you can also go down a wormhole of like hatred and disgust. Yeah. And, you know, these people who are just spewing out all of their ugly words into the world to make themselves feel better, I guess. I don't know. I, I've had a shift in the last couple of years. Of, if I see that happening, I'm like, there's something really sad going on inside that person. Yes. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And I don't I also think that not only what you put on social media, like we can easily sift those things out, but I think also all those attitudes come from the home, come from your environment, your personal environment brings that out there. So I also think there's a responsibility, like again, right to your point, Christy, about words, which is if you're a woman in your home complaining about your body to your children, you're teaching them that women are only about a certain physique. If you're in your home saying that was so dumb or wait till, your, wait till your father gets home or all these things where you dismiss yourself uh, as the authority, as the, as the authority that should be respected, to me, that trickles down to social media. It trickles down to people and their opinions and their sexism uh, because we tend to perpetuate these same ideas, I think, that we hear and we repeat without analyzing it. I mean, you know, as, as, as parents, 
what we say in front of our kids, not only just to them, but what we say in front of them mm -hmm. really matters. So uh, I know in, in this house, I've always been very careful about, we talk about health, we talk about strength. You know, I force them to do yoga with me. <laughs> Because <laughs> they, they're soccer players and I'm going, you got it, you got it, you know, you got to work all of this out. You're going to be a better player. You're going to be stronger. You're going to be faster. You're going to be more limber. And um, the whole, the same thing with eating. I mean, oh, I've got a sugar holic in my, in my house and I just try to do that. You got to balance it. You can have that, but you got to have this, you know, these green beans first or something. Mm -hmm. And talk about that, because obviously that's your most important job is your mom of three young girls and raising them. Um, talk about like the things that you do intentionally to make sure you're raising them along this path to know that women are strong and that they can do anything they want to do. Well, the funny thing is my husband and I laugh at this. My husband's a chemical engineer and I, I think he's brilliant. I mean, he's just an awesome, awesome guy all the way around. Um, but because I've always worked, I mean, we've moved for, for my career and I always give him so much credit, first of all, for that. And secondly, when Sadie, well, when we had Ava and Sophie, Sophie was about six months old. Ava was two and we, we were in a position where, okay, are we going to get a nanny? Are we going to take them here? What, what are we going to do? And and I said, are you going to stay home? And he said, well, I'm going to stay home because I don't want somebody else raising my kids. And that was just our choice. But I always give him so much credit for that because it's not like boys grow up going, I think I'll stay home with the kids. Mm -hmm. you know? I, it's, yeah. just not the, it's just not the narrative that they ever hear or see. Um, and he'll tell you the first year was hard. But he said after about a year, he went, oh, this is my job. And then it just clicked for him. And so uh, many years ago, when they were really little, he was talking about something that happened one day when he was at work, um, you know, before this. And they looked at him and they went, you went to work? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So they are just kind of living in a space where this is what I do. And he supports me and I support him because he now, he works at the kids' school. Um, but... They, they're really good about, on Friday and Saturday nights, I go into my room at between three and four o'clock and I will study for about three hours, maybe four, try to get to bed by, you know, seven, because I'm up at between 1.30 and two mm -hmm. to go to work. And they just know this is what I do. Um, they, they could care less that I'm on television, which I'm absolutely so grateful for because I have spent a lot of time tamping that whole thing down mm -hmm. um, and just saying, no, it's just my job. It's just what I do. Right, right. But I, I have also been very grateful at the faith community that they have um, because we have, you know, a lot of our friends and in our church reinforce to them the messages that I try to teach them about their, you know, their value to, to make sure that I, I had an issue with my oldest once where she was having a problem with somebody. And I said, you know what, you're not always going to be able to control who you can be around, but you can control the words that you use and the way that you treat them. And you just know that you are allowed to set that boundary. Mm -hmm. You know, this is somebody who's kind of in the group, but this is somebody I'm going to confide in. Mm -hmm. And you're allowed to do that. That was another thing that I learned from that marriage when I was making that list. I was horrible at setting boundaries. I wanted everybody to be happy. I wanted everybody to get along. <laughs> Let's all just live in fairyland here. And it wasn't until really that marriage and leaving it that I recognized I can forgive him, but I can still cut him out of my life. Mm -hmm. And that's a boundary. And you, we've all done it, haven't you? You've gone to work or you've gone somewhere where you know you're going to see somebody that you really don't trust yeah. or aren't a big fan of. Because for whatever reason, as humans, we just clash sometimes. And you know you can be cordial and civil, 
but that's not going to go. It's not going to go beyond that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's a struggle. I mean, it's hard to setting up boundaries, but it's worth it. It's worth the work. Putting the effort in and all these things is worth it. Uh, one question I have that is not as heavy as that, though, is do any of your uh, daughters have the singing abilities? Did they inherit the inherit? Um, uh, well, I think they're probably much better singers than I ever would be. Um, Ava doesn't sing so much. Sophie, from the time that she, before she could even say words, would be in the back of the car singing. And I knew what she was singing because she was on key. And she's got a very strong voice. Oh. But she doesn't want to sing, which just, you know, burns my cookie. Um, well, I, I'll switch with her because I can't carry a tune to save my life, but I want to be able to do that. So we can, she and I can cut a deal, maybe. Somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and then say my uh, then my my third Sadie is just she she I, I don't know what she's gonna be she's kind of the crapshoot she, <laughs> she can sing she can dance she can play sports um we we've kind of called her the the Ferris Bueller of her school because <laughs> something will happen and teachers will call to make sure she's okay and people <laughs> will email is she all right and. One time she had to go get stitches and she came back home with this big care package from, you know, like the school care team. We didn't know there was such a thing. <laughs> and Pete's going, well, what is this? And he said, she's the Ferris Bueller of the school. I said, do not tell her that because she would try everything Ferris Bueller did. Uh, <laughs> watch that movie over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, well, I know they've got a great example in mom of yeah. what to But well, you know, we, we mess it up. I have my moments where I've yelled at them and I will, I will say, I will go in and I will say, I'm really sorry that I yelled at you, even though you know, you did this. I was just yeah. talking about the same thing. Yes. Yeah. yes. I mean, it's important for them to see us be wrong mm -hmm. and then to own being wrong. That's really important because I'm not going to, I, Pete and I have had conversations. We are not going to raise kids who are entitled, who think that people are going to, you know, take care mm -hmm. of everything for them. Yeah. Um, they do their own laundry. They do their own dishes most of the time. One time, for any parents out there, um, I told them one time, all right, the dishwasher's broken. And they said, the dishwasher's broken. And I said, no, it's actually not. But it's broken for you for one week. If it is so hard to take a dish from the sink and put it in the dishwasher and you're incapable of doing that, then every time you do your dishes, you can take them to the sink. You have to wash them and dry them and put them away in that moment. And then after a week, we'll see if the dishwasher's back. Nice. Very and did nice. it work? Yes. For, for, yes. For, it, it did. My husband's actually the worst <laughs> violator of the dishwasher <laughs> rule. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to try that. I'm, yes. I'm going to, I'm going to remember the dishwasher. Here's another one. Try that. <laughs> My daughter, one of my daughters just leaves stuff all over the place. Like, like some fairy's going to come and clean it up for her. And I went in her room for two weeks. I said, you got to put these clothes away. And they weren't so, and they weren't done. So when she was gone, I took everything. I folded all the pieces. She had two pairs of brand new shoes. And this killed me. I put, I laid them all out on the bed and I counted. Because I knew there were things she needed that she couldn't do without. Um, like soccer stuff or whatever. And she got home and I said, there are 13 items on this bed. You can pick eight to keep and the rest are going. And there are two pairs of shoes. You can keep one of them. And she's, what, what? And she's, you know, she, then she brings down the items. But, and I did, I mean, I hated doing it, but I gave them away. Because if it's, if, what do we do if something's on the ground? If it's on the ground, it's trash, right? We're supposed right. to pick it up, but. If, if it's on the ground, then you don't value it. And there will be some other kid that will appreciate that much more. When you follow through, that's the other thing. If a lot of parents, you got to, you follow through. You got to follow through. And, and it I'll, hurts, but you've got to follow through. You got to do it. Well, it goes back to what Jen was saying. Jen and I had this conversation earlier today. Uh, I have a son. So the difference between me and the two of you is that I, I'm raising a son. And going back to how you apologize when you lose your temper. So as parents, I think we have to give ourselves a break because I mean, this is a, this is the hardest job. It is the hardest job you'll ever have. 
and yeah, you're not going to be perfect and you shouldn't have to be perfect. But I find this heavy responsibility to make sure my son understands that you that you have to apologize when you get angry, you have to let it go, you have to move on. So again, as a woman, I, of course, I, if I had a daughter, I would do this. But for a son, there's some in my mind, I'm, thinking, I'm, I'm raising this man and I want this. I, my goal is I don't want my daughter-in-law, if he chooses to marry a woman, I don't want my daughter-in-law to be mad at me. So I'm doing everything I can to make sure my daughter-in-law is mad at me. So, but yes, I apologize to him when I lose my temper and I, and I even go into explanation of, you know, I was raised a certain way. This is how I handled it, but I know it's not the right way to handle it. And I have to relearn some of the things I was taught. So, so I have a question for you Yes, because you have a son. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a lot of conversations too, when people are asking me about my book <clears throat> and parenthood, I say, we have to raise daughters who you know are strong and have a, a good sense of self-worth and of empathy and compassion and bravery and we have to raise sons who will embrace that and support it and not be um intimidated by it yes so how do you talk to your son about women do you i don't even know how, how old is he he's six. Oh, it's too early <laughs> but, well, maybe not. I mean, not so. Well, but here's the benefit, Christy. So the benefit I find is a benefit, and it's funny you say that. You know, he has two mothers, so I'm lesbian. So he's got two moms that are raising him, and we have had people in our lives say, "Well, you know, that boy is missing out because he doesn't have a man in his life." You know, that boy's missing out because he doesn't have a man in his life. Now, I certainly don't think that, but it's interesting. I wonder if two men with a daughter. Does anybody say, well, you know, that girl's missing out because she doesn't have a woman in her life. I don't know if gay men have that same, but I just find the, the underlying sexism in society is my son's not going to be a full man because he has to have what? A man there who what? Is machismo? Is John Wayne trying to tell him to toughen up and don't cry and all those things? We make sure to tell our son it's okay to cry. We make sure to tell our son like he's a, a gay man. There's not a lot of women in the gay man. And I always tell him if there's a character or who's watching, I always say, "Well, that's probably girl like that one." That's why I always drop in. Well, I bet that's a girl doing that one, and I just to tell him girls and boys love him. So he's starting to already get the messages that girls are getting left out of stuff. So he'll look at me and say, "Boys and girls, right, mom?" And I'm like, "Yes, boys and girls." And I always say, "It's not just the girls that have to listen." I say, "Girls need boys, and boys need girls. They all should be respected." So I, I just. I put that in my language back to your the importance of words. My message to him is everybody's important. Everybody bless everybody. It's okay to show your emotions, have emotions, and share them. And I just don't think boys are getting that message very often. Yeah, you're a good mom. Well, I ask him. And well, you're mom. both good moms because man, I can't believe some of the things you've been through. I, I watch you in awe. Oh, well, that's very kind of you to say. We're just figuring it out and we're figuring out together and leaning on our friends. I'm I'm writing down the dishwasher rule and the clothes on the floor because I am not too far away from that stage in my girls' lives. They're a little bit behind yours, but I, you know, I think that's why we've got to have friends to rely on to be able to raise up this next generation and for them to see. And my husband's always excited about my close group of girlfriends. And he's like, I'm so glad our girls are growing up around your group of friends because everybody has different careers and different interests, but they're all just very strong, dynamic, big personalities. And my girls are getting raised around these women who are all examples for them. So it's not just us, but it's our friends that we surround ourselves with. Gosh, that's so true. I mean, our, I, we talk about how we were saying earlier, you know, our kids, it's not just what we say to them, but they will pay attention to other conversations. I bet they do. Uh, I bet they do really benefit or learn from those friends that we have around all the time. Right. It's about who do you surround yourself with and showing them who you surround yourself with, you know, who's going to be worthy of their friendship someday. You know, we're modeling it for them all the time. So, and, and one last thing, and as my dog is barking, I apologize. But, uh, you know, it's also the fact that they will, 
lean on, like you said, Christy, earlier, if you have two or three core friends. Well, your daughter's seeing you with two or three core friends. Subconsciously, they'll understand, well, that's, that's what you do. That's how you get your life. That's what you establish for yourself. So I also think our children seeing our social engagement inspires them to have social engagement, you know, and I think it's so important for them not to be isolated, and especially our children who are living in technology and some of our children who now are at home for a year because of COVID. I think that, yeah, our, our friend groups are very influential for the way that they'll develop their friend groups. How are your kids doing through COVID? A remotely, so I'm a kidney transplant recipient. I know that you have done plenty of research and stories about the transplant community, and I thank you for that. And I have to be hunkered down until I get vaccinated. And my son, because of that, is I I don't have him in school, so he's remote learning and he's adjusting. I think he misses his friends, but I think he also enjoys the time with his mom. How about you, Jen? They're doing good. Um, my little one is in a preschool program. So there's only about eight kids in her class. So she's been back in since August and they're being real cautious and wearing masks all day. And then my older one's a second grader and they're back in school four days out of five. She's got one home virtual, but it's made all the difference for her to be with her teacher and back in school. And it sets up a rhythm in our life um, and uh, in our day that is a really healthy rhythm for our family that, you know, we set up, everybody does the breakfast thing. And then we, you know, have those, those patterns and those markers throughout the day. So it's been really helpful for them to be back in. Are your kids in school or at home? They're home. Um, Sadie goes in a couple of days a week to something they call kiddos that they, they let some of the kids come back, you know, for, for different reasons every now and then. Um, but they've still had soccer. They've still, had Bible study. Um, they It was virtual for a while, but it's really kind of getting back to more of a regular schedule. Um, you know, my husband had COVID in July mm. um, and it was horrid. I can mm. tell you, horrid. Oh, um, so he was around for three and a half weeks. Wow. Um, but we never got it. Me or the girl, none of the, me or the girls, Never. I mean, we were in a car with him for 13 hours driving home from Ohio. When he had it, we didn't, nobody knew he had it. He didn't know he had it until two days later. And he recognized that two days later when he was down, he said, did you, you know, smell the air pressure in the car when we were coming home? And I said, yeah. And he said, I didn't smell it. And he didn't think, he, he didn't think about it then because it's that sense that you don't really know you're missing. Right. <laughs> until you lose your taste once you lose your taste then you go oh wait a minute right um, but it's been i was talking to a um and this was really eye opening to me i was talking to a, a child psychologist about what some of these kids are going to be left with cuz some kids are really having such a hard time some of them are just they're not even logging in for school and i'm thinking these poor kids you know they just maybe they maybe they are with a single parent and that's so hard alone as it is. But then you've got to leave a kid home from school or something. And we were talking about what this is going to leave for some of these children afterwards. And he said, what I have recognized is that kids will often do as well as their parents are doing. Wow. Okay. So I thought, okay, this wow. is, again, one of those moments where we have to recognize how we're reacting, what words we're using, and, and no, rem just remember our kids are watching us. Absolutely. It's funny you say that. There's a there's a kid in my son's class, and, you know, the parents can't help it. They have to work. So I can tell that her parents are working, and she is five in kindergarten, having to do Zoom by herself, find her supplies by herself, do and have no, she has no aid, and I can tell the teacher's so patient with her, you know, and and tries to help, but it sometimes has to fuss at her because it's like you're going to go have to find an adult to help you with this, and I just think she feels behind, she feels alone, she feels scared, but she's hanging in there. She's, I don't know, and so to your point, it's like even through this year, I've looked at her like. I just want to embrace her, you know, I just want to go over to her house or have her come to mind. And, um, you know, so like you said, those subtle things where, she, you know, she's not feeling supported right now. So it's like you want to give the message to the parents that she needs a little extra to kind of 
maybe um, balance this out. I don't know, but and it's got to be hard as a parent to leave. Absolutely. And leave their kid at home to do this on their own. But I mean, some, they just don't have a choice. Exactly. Right. right? It's so there's no, there's no bad guy in that situation. There's no bad guy. Right. It's what it right. Is. right. And those teachers, oh my gosh, they're amazing. I can hear them sometimes because we have three different sections where kids are on, you know, virtual here. Right. And one of them is often downstairs. Um, so I'm relegated to the bedroom, to my bedroom for most of the day. And I can hear the teacher going, your camera's not on, turn your camera on to, you know, somebody else. I know it's not my kid because I'm looking at her. Um, but gosh, what these teachers are dealing with, just trying to keep the attention yeah. um, of kids. And it's understandable, but man, they need, there are some serious heroes walking among us right now. With all the people you've interviewed at CNN, I mean, what are we looking at? How far are we from the end of this? Is it going to be... A slow ending? I I don't know. Okay. Um, I think there's a lot of hope in these vaccines, mm -hmm. um, especially the Johnson and Johnson one. Once that they try the trials are finished and and that would be ready to go because that's a one shot deal, um, yes. rather than the two. But with the variants, I think that's what's in question. Um, they say right now that all of the, va the vaccines are effective against the variants. Uh, but I, I think people are counting on herd immunity to some degree. Mm -hmm. I think they're saying that we need to be ready to wear masks and social distance for a long time. I, I mean, for a good chunk of this year, if we're really honest, but I don't, I think there has been so much confusion about what this virus was and how it was transmitted in, you know, in the beginning. And there are, I think that's what fueled some people's um, mistrust or distrust in powers that be that were telling us what to do and what not to do. But uh, I think a lot of it, what, one of the, themes that we've heard a lot is, you know, we have the power uh, amongst us to stop it earlier or to keep the death toll from becoming more than it needs to be. But we don't know. I mean, there's so much that we don't know. Mm -hmm. There's really still so much we don't know. We have to rely on hope. We have to do the personal responsibility part of it for our families, for our kids to take care of each other. Um, but we just have to, you know, rely on hope that I think, we're Georgia, do this. I think Georgia, Georgia's numbers are decreasing. We know that. Um, I, I feel like things are a little more normal than they used to be. I mean, we're certainly seeing it in traffic. You know, there's more traffic out. Um, and I just hope that that doesn't take us backwards. I, yeah. I don't think it will. I do think that now that there's a vaccine, a couple of them, and they're getting them distributed and administered, uh, but that is still, that is still one of the biggest obstacles right now is the distribution and being able to administer because the resources just aren't there. They've got the vaccines, but the right. resources just aren't there. And some places where they need the vaccines, they don't have them. Right. Mm -hmm. Hopefully our new leadership is fixing this rollout and hopefully it will improve in the months to come. Um, but, um, but we just want to say thank you so much. Yes. So much. Oh my gosh. Awesome. Christy Paul. <laughs> yeah. Our, I mean, you were, you were, our, your first guest here on the friends. How did it, how, how did it feel? Is it everything you dreamt of? I'm just honored beyond words that I got to be the first. And the nice thing that I know is this is going to go up from here for you guys. Like, like I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, cause we keep talking about how words matter. I'm not trying to say, you know, that I'm the bottom of the barrel. There is no bottom of the barrel. We're all in this together. That's right. But um, I think that you guys, this has been so conversational. I mean, we're just having a conversation and that is so nice, especially amongst women who are supportive, who are embracing of everybody. And we need to see more of that so much. I mean, I always tell women, I tell anybody, you know, at any point 
in your life, you have the power to say, this is not how my story is gonna end. And as we continue to tell their stories, hopefully we're gonna continue to give other people who are listening that hope and recognize that you are not alone and we are all in this together and you may feel like nobody is for you, but there are people that are for you and we are it. So awesome. Yes. So awesome. Now y'all you've got to follow Christy Paul TV on Instagram and you're always sharing all kinds of different news stories, what's going on at CNN. And of course we can see you at the anchor desk. Are you doing your weekend show on Saturday and Sunday from home? Are you going to the studio? No, we go to the studio, but it's very, very different. You know, we used to have, I don't know, maybe 25 people there. When we got there, there's four. Wow. Well, people are working from home and, and Victor and I are in separate studios that are right next to each other, but we're in separate studios. And um, I, you know, I'm still getting up at three, two, well, I'm getting in the car at three o'clock or 10 to, I try to get there about 2.45 and just get in the car and drive in. And it's amazing to me how many people are on the road on Sunday morning. I don't know where they're coming from. <laughs> I mean, when it was, when it was, not COVID, there were all these people out and there's a there's a Waffle House down by CNN that I have to pass. And I am telling you, the line would snake out of Waffle House. <laughs> the it's a place to and be. people are in their club clothes and they're having fun. And, <laughs> and, and there are still people doing that. There's just not as many, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Well, you be careful on the roads going in then. That's a, that sounds like a, it could be a scary situation too. But it is. That's true. But but it's all good. So um, thank you so much for having me. This is this has really been such a joy, and I admire you both so much. And I love that you're doing this because I, I think I heard you say, and I can't remember where it was, um, but you were talking about how it might have been on, on Instagram. You were talking about how we don't need to wait for somebody to give us permission mm -hmm. to do what yeah. we want to do. And I think we do that. I think we kind of wait to see, is there a green light? Is there an opening? Is there, you know what, if there's something that you really want to do, figure it out and do it. Okay. And, and you're doing that. And so you're an example of that, but even bigger than that, you're an example of having these conversations that matter. So thank you for what you're doing. Oh, thank thanks, you. Oh, that's so awesome. Thank you so much for being here. We really, really appreciate your friendship. And um, we want everybody to go get your book as well. So your book will be in the show notes. It's Christy Paul, Love Isn't Supposed to Hurt, a memoir. And you can follow Christy Paul TV on Instagram and reach out to her if you have more questions about any of the things that we've talked about. And we're really interactive with the folks who follow you. Yeah, please do. Please do, because I, I can talk about this till the cows come home, as I say in rural Ohio. Nice to be part of the frenzy. We love having you here. Thank you. Then more power to the frenzy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Wasn't that a great conversation with Christy? <laughs> She's awesome. <laughs> I'm just feeling motivated and so excited. So I am. I feel pumped. legitimate. No, I'm sorry. I feel legitimate because we had somebody of her stature on our show. So we're, I know. we're running. <laughs> she is such a boss and just so humble and kind. That was really, really awesome. So uh, you'll have to go get Christy's book. We'll make sure to put it in the show notes and it'll be listed online as well. So make sure you're following us on social media and go grab her book and learn more about Christy Paul. Okay, so Betty White just turned 99 and she's got some really great advice Yay. for how she lived such a long, happy life. Well, she made it through the pandemic. I'm ready, but she made it through the pandemic, which to me is like, I think there was a lot of people who teasingly throughout 2020 said, don't go, Betty, you know, because celebrities started dying and they're like, oh, is Betty White still alive? No, is Betty White still alive? <laughs> Take Betty. You can't take yeah. Betty. So, if yeah, she so. turns a hundred, if she becomes a what is it, a centenarian? Yes. Centenarian next year. We're throwing a yes. party. Oh, yes, a Betty White party. Oh, well, that'd by then fun. we'll be able, we'll be able to get together. So that'll be we good. We can actually have a party by then. Yeah. Yes, I love that. Okay. So Betty White says that you gotta laugh, right? Yeah. She says the sense of humor is what keeps her going, and don't take yourself too seriously. She said, You can lie to others but you cannot lie to yourself. And, and it, I, you know, I thought about that on her birthday earlier this year because she is 99 and I'm, and I'm, I'm 
hesitating because I can't remember the guy's name, but all those comic geniuses like Mel Brooks is still alive. The guy that just passed, he was like 99 or 98 or something like Dick Van Dyke. Mm -hmm. So everybody that's worked in comedy, if you think about it, like I'd love to do a comparison. Those who work in comedy and laugh more and work on making other people laugh mm -hmm. seem to live longer. I have to tell you my Dick Van Dyke story because I got to interview him in California oh. and it, I, I just loved him so much. I got him to sing. He sang oh, for me. I was amazing. It was so oh. amazing. Okay. All right. Back to Betty White. Yeah. Other advice that she has is stay positive. Um, she says the key is to accentuate the positive, not the negative. It sounds so trite, but a lot of people will pick out something to complain about rather than say, hey, that was great. She said, it's not hard to find great stuff if you look. Uh, isn't that the damn truth? Like I, yes. so um, my son is six and he tends to logically try to fix things, logically see what needs to be done. And I'm trying to in instill in him early. Think about the, think about what's working, not what's not working. Think, you know, glass half full mentality, because I've said many times and some, hopefully someday it'll click. It's like, if you can figure out that piece of advice, you will have a joyful life because, um, if you don't, if you don't celebrate the successes as you go along, then you are going to be miserable. Like you have There's to stop and think about that. Always two ways to look at things. A friend of mine that I work with the other day got a flat tire and he was like on the way to work. He was stressed out. He was supposed to be joining this live broadcast and he got a screw in his tire, tire popped, had to go to the uh, you know, to the tire shop. He was late joining this broadcast. He got home, had to do it from home and he was supposed to do it from the studio. I mean, it was like, it, it made his life a hot mess. And at the end I said, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? And he said, I'm just feeling safe and relieved. And I thought, what a great way wow. to look yeah. at a screw in your tire, right? Because other people would say, oh, now I'm broke. I got to pay for yeah. this. This was a horrible day. But his perspective on it was I'm safe and relieved that yeah. I made it home safe. He's See, got he, two he, little babies. He's you know, got like, that. Yeah. He's, he's got just, that mentality. He's just got that choice. It's a choice. It is a choice. We all got it. Right. And Betty White says, choose it. She also says, avoid complaining. She said, I know it sounds corny, but I try to see the funny side and the upside, not the downside. I get bored with people who, who complain about this or that. It's such a waste of time. Oh, that's my what God. you always say. Oh, you hate complaining. <laughs> I hate complaining. Don't complain to me. Mm -mm. And Betty White's last bit of advice is vodka and hot dogs. <laughs> and she says, quote, probably in that order. Oh, <laughs> I just love that she's still with us. Happy 99th birthday, Betty. Yay. Oh my gosh. So awesome. Because we grew up so with, much. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's rare for us to have one celebrity that we grew up with because I know I'm a little older than you, but like, I remember her on, um, match game. I remember her on, uh, with, on the Carol Burnett show. Uh, and then she went on to mama's family. I mean, and she was on a uh, password and that's who her husband was. Um, and they met there and it, it's just, and so, and then golden girls. And then, um, you know, she, she's just been a part of our lives from little kids to now. And it's so comforting because as you get older, like I mentioned my parents, but you have, you start having friends and you start, you know, my mother always said when the celebrities you love start passing away is when you really start really feeling it. your age. Yeah. yeah. Cause she told me one time, I think when Paul Newman died, you know, she was like, she was hurt. So hurt. Cause that was her big crush. And she's like, you know, for some, when Tom Cruise dies or when, you know, at the time before he, he jumped on the couch, but like, I mean, for people right, who right. have this crush, She's like, that's when it really hits you <laughs> It's when your contemporaries go. So it just, yeah, I'm just so glad that Betty's still with us. I'm so glad that Dick Van Dyke, because I think about the celebrities that I would wear black for. And they, Pat, Betty's one of them, Dick Van Dyke, Julie Andrews. When Julie Andrews dies, I'm going to, I'm going to probably take off from any work and just in more. We should try to get them on the show. We can make that our mission before oh. Betty White turns a hundred. We'll talk to her on the phone. Oh, front. wouldn't that be wonderful? That'd be amazing. 
I bet she knows how to do StreamYard. She's pretty hip. Oh, sure. Like, okay. Or she, she found like, somebody. Find somebody to click yeah, exactly. on the link. And she, she just chat it up with us. She just has to have her vodka with her when she does it. Except that, that... you and I would just spend the entire time worshiping her. Oh my god. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm not sure she'd get a word in edgewise because we'd be like, oh, we just love oh you. Just, oh just, oh just, remember that time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh. A dream. I, you know what? You get, yes, yes. We're going to try to do it. We're going to try so everybody can share the experience with Betty and Julie and Dick and um, who else? Carol Burnett and like just all those. Melissa's wonderful. wish list. <laughs> my wish list. Exactly. Okay, yes. I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, cool. all right. So you don't know my life here on camera. There's the logo for it. You don't know my life, which is a board game that Dennis Hensley, who's a friend of mine, a former colleague of mine, he and a partner created this game uh, and it's a board game, but I usually take the cards with me when I'm out to dinner or with friends. Uh, and basically it is, you just ask questions and you get to know about your friends, some things that you never knew before. Okay. So here's an example. We're going to play around. I'm going to ask the a question to Jen. I'm going to answer the same question. Okay. Okay. What's a fun fact or random bit of knowledge that has stuck with you from your days in school? Oh, that's a good question. And all of these jog my memory so well, because that is not my strong suit, my memory. <laughs> well, I'm going to get, I'm going to give you a chance to think and explain that, that the beauty of this game is I've known for, I mean, not Jen and I've known each other for decades. I've known other friends for decades and I will learn things about them that I never knew about through these questions, because you don't think to ask, hey, Jen, what is something that you remember from right. your school? I mean, like that doesn't come up in conversation, right? Like a bit of knowledge from your school days. I'm trying to think, like, would it be uh, from an English class or math or history or? I'll, I'll answer it. Okay. okay. So I got to see it first. I'll answer it because it's something from my mom. Um, and it's one of those little Southern things that I don't do now because I don't carry a purse, but it's carrying a Buckeye in your purse. Have you ever heard of this? No. What is it? So it's apparently it's supposed to give you luck. It's just a, it's just, What's if you a carry Buckeye. So a Buckeye is a kind of nut. Sorry, I don't know. It's okay. okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's a kind of nut. So if, uh, if you, if you ever, what the weirdest mascot, I think is the Ohio state Buckeyes. Their mascot is a, is the nut. It's a, it's a Buckeye. It's, his face is a nut and it's got a body anyway, okay. but it is a kind of nut. And the idea is you just carry it in on you and it's supposed to bring you luck. And it's this old wives tale. So I, the first thing I thought about is all through uh, my life, I would carry a Buckeye in my purse. I carried it in high school. I carried it in college. Mm -hmm. I carried it after college when I started working in radio I cared more, you know, we got to the, in the habit of either carrying a backpack or a briefcase or something, you yeah. know, that's not a, I, I don't carry both. I don't carry a purse and a briefcase. I'll just put all my stuff in a briefcase. So I, I got out of the habit, uh, when I started doing that and didn't have it, um, you know, I didn't put a Buckeye in a, in a case, but yeah, a Buckeye supposed to you need bring to do it, it again. Didn't I need you to tell me that one of your fancy friends just got you a coach backpack. Yeah. <laughs> I know because you my got this coach. really fancy honor. Tell yes. everybody about your honor first. So of all, I fancy backpack. Okay, <laughs> well, I need to show. I'll have to show it. I don't. I, um, so a, a a friend of mine from high school who I'm still dear friends with, uh, who lives in Knoxville. Um, I was. I'm honored to be on the advisory board, the LGBT advisory board for Mayor Keisha Bottoms, who is the mayor of Atlanta, and who President Biden has nominated as the vice chair of the Democratic National Committee. So uh, I am on her advisory board. So basically, I help guide her through decisions for the LGBT community here in Atlanta. And I'm on a board with several other men and women. Um, and so when I got um, named to that advisory board, my friend in Knoxville said, I, I've got a gift for you and I'm going to send it your way. And I said, okay, cool. And it was a coach bag. It was a coach little backpack that was rainbow colored. And, and now going to be a Buckeye in it. And now there's going to be a Buckeye in it. That's okay. right. My, my Buckeye and my rainbow bag. That's so cool. <laughs> I love that. Okay, what's one little thing from my school days? See, I was thinking factoid or something like that. that. Yeah, whatever comes to mind. Oh, man. Melissa, I wish I had a really great story. When you started talking about the advice from your mom, I thought about this advice from my dad. How about mm -hmm. I go with that? Sure. My dad always said, take care of your hands because people pay attention to your hands. 
So I don't know if he walked by one day and I was like maybe biting a nail or something. I've never been like a real nail biter, but maybe this is why, because my dad said, you know, you should always take care of your hand, take care of your nails, take care of your hands, men or women, because people notice your hands. My dad had the same, he, he would take, he would take chapstick and he, he didn't go like, this was before the time where men felt comfortable going into the salon and getting their nails buffed and stuff. So my father, every oh, morning, yeah. my dad would have never done that. Yeah. But my father, every morning, uh, my parents bedroom was on the deck and they had a sliding glass door out to the deck. So he would sit in the, he would stand in the sun of that window. I remember going down the hall and seeing him in the door and he would check his nails like he would always make sure it was yeah. clean and, and lotioned and everything but he would take chapstick and put it around his cuticles to soften his cuticles that's what he used and it would also brighten up his nails so he would take the chapstick out of his pocket and he would just run around his nails every morning before he went to work yeah i don't know what that is and he had beautiful our hands. parents generation my, yeah my dad's my, got great hands yeah. too I like, thought beautiful and, hands. Yeah, he's never not one time ever complained about my mom going to get her nails done or whatever. Like he always said that. Just take care of your hands, you know. You got and also like that was followed by like you got to have a firm good handshake. Right, yes. But, like take Go care of your hands. hands. Yeah. People look at your hands and have a firm handshake and look people in the eye. And the beauty of that is I'm glad your father said that to you because a lot of fathers would have skipped over their daughters and just said that to their sons. Right. So oh, that's, yeah. no, not my dad. We were all the same and I yeah. had to mow the lawn more than my brother. <laughs> yes. I, my father, my yes. All three of us got away with thing. playing while I had to go do yard work because we lived in Florida and nothing ever died. There's no seasons in Florida. It all just it's grows true. all the time. <laughs> oh, so yeah, we had three acres and I rode the, the riding mower. So I think as a girl, I got away with getting the riding mower instead of, and my brother had to push it. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. I learned a lot and had a lot of like green stained grass shoes from that. But I say that my father had a green thumb and my sister's the one with the green thumb. So she'll push it. She'll ride it. She'll smol you know, mulch it. She'll <laughs> scrape the things out of the gutters. I mean, she's, she's the workhorse when it comes to outside. Well, we want to say thank you so much to Dennis for sponsoring the podcast. And we want to say thanks to you for listening. So leave us a five-star review and subscribe to the podcast. And you're automatically entered to win this really cool prize. It is a Amazon all new Echo Dot fourth generation smart speaker with Alexa. So we're really excited to give that to somebody. And just by leaving a five-star review and subscribing to the podcast, you're already entered to win. You don't have to do anything else. And if you like this show uh, and you want to share it with a friend who you think could use this kind of conversation, please share the episode. Just go ahead and forward it to her text message right now. And if you like this, you can screen grab it and tag us online at The Frenzy on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter. Musical score has been brought to you by Atlanta musician Tammy Hurt. The Frenzy's graphic design is by Helen Vickers and web design by Caden Jacobs. And next week, we're going to share with you ways to reframe your inner voice around your own age. And we'll give you a new mantra to try in the mirror. So make sure you subscribe and we will see you next week. Trust your gut. Use your voice. Stop, Stop lying, lying about, about your age. age. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time.